think those uh, who have made it have realized that this material is not available anywhere else. That's right. The reason is, is that no one in the world knows. It's not that I know and no one else knows, it's that no one has known, but that the field of information is like a matrix. And we have generated a lot of information. We've enriched this matrix of information, but no one has really circuited through this matrix a coordinate uh, intelligence. And what I'm doing is taking a template of viewpoints with a methodological firmness and passing them through this matrix and trying to deliver to you spontaneously as you hear it what comes out. What does this uh, super enriched soup of transformation that actually occurred about 2,000 years ago look like? What does it read out when we pass certain disciplined um, methodologies through it? One of the few individuals who attempted to handle one strand in this area was a man named uh, Goodenow, E.R. Goodenow, and the Bollingen series published in 13 volumes his great work, Jewish Symbols in the Greco-Roman Period. And I made sure that the PRS library uh, got my set of this, so I don't have it here in the Whirling Rainbow Library. But the PRS has it. But of course, uh, as you must know, or, or might know, it's put up into a side room, and you have to have special permission to go up and use it. And they're only open 12 hours a week, and that's generally from 1 to 4 on weekdays. So it's almost, unfortunately, inaccessible. When I find another set, I'll buy it. But I found volume 12, which is summary and conclusions. Volume 13 was the general index with maps. But volume 12, I found another copy. And so I'm going to give you a couple of paragraphs of Good Nose Conclusions. He spent a whole lifetime in this field. He is of Jewish background, tremendously intelligent, tremendously honest, um, not orthodox, but what we would call humanist. He would like to know also. What, uh, what are there uh, in this uh, matrix of um, information, what forms are there? Now he, uh, he went through a, a whole series of volumes, 11 volumes, reviewing archaeological data and reviewing uh, whatever literary data. And his object was to try to disclose for us what was Hellenistic Judaism? What were the Hellenis Hellenized Jews like? because they're essentially important to everyone. They were, uh, to use a phraseology that I sometimes use, magnetized human beings. Whatever they came, came into contact with, whoever and whatever, became magnetized and polarized because of the tremendous elan and energy. It's like if you rub a piece of iron against a magnet long enough, the piece of iron will become polarized and thus magnetized. The Hellenized Jews were a magnetic center for the interpenetration of cultures, and that they were forced into this situation against their will, time and time again. The archetypal situation was the Babylonian captivity, where they were just physically taken away into captivity and for several hundred years had to live under Persian rule. And we have seen that only certain elements of the Jewish population survived, those who interiorized their sense of significance and values. And when they came back into power in the period of the Second Temple, the Maccabean times, they tended to express 
exter exteriorize this internal capacity so that the internal synthesis became the structural projection upon which the exterior forms began to gel and take shape. It did produce a Jewish kingdom with a Jewish king, the Maccabees, up to John Hyrcanius. It lasted for about two generations and then fell and, and was swallowed up by the Hellenistic uh, kingdoms. But what did not disappear and what actually thrived on the adversity was the interiorized synthesis that the Jewish individual survived. The person, the human person, and survived because they could participate in this tremendous confusion without being a part of it. And eventually, at the end of the second century BC, around 100 BC, this pattern had become conscious, self-conscious. They realized, we have survived this long, we have gotten this far, just in reaction to events and situations that have constantly occurred to us. Let's take hold of the tiger by the tail. Let's see what comes out when we consciously do this. And these communities of the elect began to congregate. They were like uh, utopian communities. But they were utopian from an interior standpoint. and what they were experimenting with. What is going to come out of us when we add self-consciousness to this integrated capacity which we have discovered that we have? That you can, you can beat us, you can kill us, you can exile us, you can drag us across the face of the earth. We are still who we are. You can make us speak different languages. We are still who we are. We can speak many languages. We are still who we are. Let us consciously then experiment with communities of individuals like ourselves and see what comes out. And what came out was universally efficacious because what emerged against the context, the background of this community of the elect, as we will see, was the righteous one. The communities of righteousness produce the capacity to see the form of man as the righteous one. And when that capacity was seen, it took only one generation for the discussions to center around the possibility of manifesting a righteous one a Messiah. It was not a condition where the Messiah comes all of a sudden as a big surprise. It's like having put your order in and made the specifications and saying all these conditions have to be met. Whatever else there is, all these conditions have to be met. And the conditions kept refining themselves until Around 50 B.C., when we see the book of the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, they had become quite refined. But now the problem is, we don't know, no one knows any longer exactly what happened because all of the participants, all of the, the beneficiaries of the participants in those events, all of them, without exception, covered up the integrating centuries ignored them, pushed them out of sight. The Christians didn't want to talk about them because they had something else to do. The Jews didn't want to talk about it. They had something else to do. The Romans all died off. 
almost uh, everybody who was involved in it disappeared and so we didn't have material we didn't have any images we had nothing to work with until the late 19th century when archaeology began turning things up and in the 20th century when documents started turning up by the bushel a lot of documents have turned up and now they've all been translated all the archaeological work has been done all the monographs have been published and we're one of the first groups that's taking a look at this what happened what happened this conclusion was written in 1965 by E.R. Goodenough, who was the world's expert, one of the few. And as you can see, as a world expert, he's going to say, I don't really know. But we think some of these conclusions are viable, and here they are. The foregoing summary shows that the study as a whole has really divided itself into three parts, for we have been trying to discover what impact Greek religion and thought had upon Jews of the ancient world. And we have examined three chief sources of information. First, there are the literary remains of admittedly Hellenized Jews. Then the archaeological remains from Jewish graves and synagogues of the whole range of Mediterranean civilization. And third, the biblical paintings of Dura, now, they found at Dura, which is in the uh, Iraqi uh, plain area, archaeologists found an intact synagogue. And what was shocking about the Dura synagogue, which was explored archaeologically in the late 20s and in the 30s by Americans, they found that all of the traditional pictures of Hellenized Jews were completely wrong that all of the scholarly conjecture about them had gone way off on a tangent and actually betrayed the actual situation. And this is what prompted Goodenow, as a young student in the 30s. Well, if our picture is wrong, what is the picture? And so he spent his whole life with this, and this is his um, uh, summation. If there is any such thing as coherence among the three, among the archaeological remains, among the literary remains, and among the correlation of those two classes of material, types of material, with the actual uh, integrated site of the Dura Synagogue, if there is any such thing as coherence among the three, the painting should prove to reflect the ideas we have found in the literary remains and archaeological symbols. Literary remains and archaeological symbols, which before were more or less categorized and ordered in a hodgepodge way on a speculative basis, but the speculative basis has been displaced now by an actual site that's intact that we found. No one made up the Dura Synagogue. Those people built it, they worshipped in it, they lived in it, and so the site itself does not lie. And how it integrates the material has to be given primacy over scholarly or religious scholarship. This is what Goodenow is saying, and he's a great world-renowned scholar, but he's saying it is time to take our coats off and get to work because we have a whole new insight into the origins of this particular civilized situation that we happen to inherit. One of the far-reaching uh, conclusions, which Goodenow does not draw here, but in other works does, is that we are in trouble because we are living on lives. And it is no wonder that human beings can't integrate themselves, that civilizations can't work in our time, because we don't have anything real to found ourselves on. We're just building sandcastles. So here's some bedrock. He writes, Some of my Jewish friends believe that there is a fourth approach, that of examining the rabbinical writings for evidence, fragmentary as it might appear, of Greek influences even within the rabbinic schools. Saul Lieberman, for example, has begun <coughs> 
on this kind of study, but I feel only begun. A fifth approach would be in such a study of the Septuagint as has never been systematically made to see how the very process of using Greek words for Hebrew, the original meaning would have been modified. For example, uh, Greek-speaking Jews thought of God as Theos, which would have had quite a different conception from a Hebrew who thought of God as Adonai, Elohim, or Yahweh. Theos had been used for so great a number of gods that it meant rather a level of being than a person at all, and was rapidly becoming a metaphysical abstraction. But the Hebrew words were really, the last one definitely, proper names of one personal God. His name was Yahweh. It's not a conception. That's his name. It's different. A sixth source of information promises to be available in a new mystic Gnostic material that Gershom Sholem is bringing to us from the early rabbis to see what is naturally Hebrew and what seems to have been taken over from Greco-Roman concepts. If these be the sources of information for the Hellenization of Judaism, and I would by no means consider it an ultimate list, it appears clear that in the foregoing study we have by no means finished the task and that conclusions must still be quite tentative. What the term Hellenized Judaism will ultimately come to include, we cannot now say. This is the world's expert telling us just 20 years ago, quite legitimately, we really don't know. But the demonstration has gone far enough to justify some confident statements quite beyond those hitherto possible. In this final section, I shall accordingly outline what I have concluded as the most likely hypothesis from the material now at hand. I have repeated rather tiresomely that the material proves very little beyond the tautological. That's an equivalence. A equals A is a tautology. But surprising fact of its own existence, he's saying that the material indicates that it really existed. And in that, in that tautological um, terseness, there's a little bit of a lesson for us. It's a lesson in intellectual humility. Yes, the material is skimpy, but it is real. And you will founder all of the great cosmic speculations that are fantasized upon these little rocks because they're not going to go away. So they have to be taken into consideration. Whatever you're going to come up with, they have to be taken into consideration. This is new. This is new. Because all the theological traditions, Christian, Jewish, Islamic, <coughs> have completely set aside these fragments and said they're irrelevant. And good knows, say, we have to face the fact that they are relevant, that whatever else we're going to do, we have to take them into consideration. This bends the fantasizing capacities of the mind back into some concrete shape, back into some form. He writes, but it seems to me overwhelmingly probable that the actual artifacts in Rome and Dura are more reliable evidence for Jewish thought in Rome and Dura than are the Mishnah and early Mishradim uh, Midrashim of the rabbis in Palestine. This is a very tough thing to say. This is equivalent of a Christian saying that all of Christian theology up to 1965 will have to be set aside because we have excavated a Christian site which shows us that we don't know what we're talking about. This is monumental. This is a watershed, this kind of realization. Does this undermine faith? No, because if faith had to exist as a speculative fantasy ungrounded in reality, it was not worth harboring. If it was so wrong, in its vectoring, if it was so fragile in its structure that 
it was confounded by a few bits of evidence from historical situations, then it was not worth harboring in the first place. So man learns a little humility again to come back. He goes on, and you can read the conclusion in the volume for yourself at your leisure. Now, in this welter of material, archaeological, literary, and speculative, it's the, the difficult part is finding some place to start. Where do you start? Where's the trustworthy center pole around which the circumambulation can give us a vision? The most trustworthy of all the documents that we have is the Book of Enoch. Because the Book of Enoch is primal, it's not written by a single author at a single time, but is produced over about a hundred years of time by at least five different authors. And so it in itself is like a telescope, which if we open out the parts, we can see through one way microscopically and through the other way cosmically. And we can see in the five parts of the Book of Enoch, the five sections, a progressive development Now, in itself, the use of the term progressive here is prejudicial. So I caution you that um, I'm using it in that way. I'm using it in a uh, prejudicial way. That there was a development. That there was a history of an idea, if you want. There was the fleshing out of a vision. And the basic core of that vision is delivered here, as we saw in the first part. The basic core of the division, of the divisions and the revelation uh, behind those divisions, is that the individual person has the capacity to direct themselves totally, personally, immediately, directly to the divine. You don't need an intermediary. You don't need a priesthood. You don't need a Torah. You don't need a doctrine. You don't need a committee that the individual as himself can come into direct and truthful contact with the divine. This is the beginning of the Book of Enoch, this revealing of the fact and the ascription to this man of the name Enoch just harkens back symbolically to the biblical tradition because Enoch is the seventh son from Adam. And in the Hebraic cycle, seven is a uh, cycle of completeness. And seven sevens is, uh, is like an aeon. After seven sevens, then you have a jubilee. It, uh, it means just like it sounds. It's a celebration point. It's a node that we've had a cycle of cycles. You know the phrase, king of kings? It's like that. Uh, That there's a sense of completed form, and when you have a cycle of completed forms, that in itself is a completed form, but of a transcendental kind. So that a jubilee is a transcendental point, moment of celebration. And so every uh, 49th or every 50th would be this note, but also seven then becomes the basic uh, alphabet, the basic uh, working member of the vocabulary of meaning becomes the cycle of seven. So the seventh son is very important. Enoch is the seventh son from Adam. He comes through the Seth line, not through Abel or Cain, but through Seth. In fact, the lineage is given at the beginning of the second Um, section of the book of Enoch. And in fact, it begins by by telling us that this is the second vision which he saw. That same man who had direct contact with God, who we are going to call Enoch because of symbolical associations, that wasn't his name, but that's what we're calling him. 
because his significance is all bound up with the fact that he ends a whole cycle of complication and brings it clear that with him we can finally see that this is the pattern and if we extend that pattern we can see what the larger epi uh, um, epicycle is going to turn out to be and that's what the Enochian literature is all about is saying look these are the patterns and they show us that to complete these patterns that we're involved in that there's going to have to be a messianic figure occur not now but coming up in fact we we can compute in our way when he's going to occur and where we can do all the correlations and we can say it's going to occur at such and such a place at such and such a time what are we going to do in the meantime we're going to get ready what else would conscientious human beings do they're going to prepare themselves and so the first century BC was a time of massive preparation for the millennium they didn't see it as coming down to the year zero and you have to now symbolically see that we're going to talk about the year zero all they saw was in terms of the patterning which they had figured out its structure that this event was coming and it was coming closer and closer and that in order to prepare it now here's the second vision which he saw the vision of wisdom the vision of wisdom uh, the Greek word for wisdom is feminine Sophia there's always this uh, natural parallel a man who beholds a vision is like a man who sees the woman she is beautiful she is for him she is a source of life if he enters into a covenant with her he will be able to live the good life not the fun life but good as in Plato this is an interesting transposition of energies the traditional Jewish God was masculine Yahweh was masculine and all the way through the tradition is is that man has to open himself up to the divine as if he were a woman for the divine he has to be faithful to the, the divine as if he were a wife for the divinity you could say that this is a primitive tribal psychology and it is but it has its guts it has its psychological tenacity it means that man's faithfulness to his God it preserves the divine marriage that is going on but now the divine is feminine and man has to learn to be masculine in this relationship he has to learn to take care of the divine as he would take care of his wife this is a this is a massive switching of roles it's what Jung calls psychologically an in antiodromia you keep the shape the psychological archetypal shape but you turn it upside down well a lot of things that were faults are going to fall off but any structure that was had integrity will still work but it's going to work the other way now and this is what happens in the first century BC is that the whole psyche actually the, by the second century BC this turning by the first century it was already in place so the second century BC is this whole turning this in antiodromia the religious psyche of Jewish mankind turned on its head during the second century BC and put the ethical judgmental seat of control in man's hands rather than in the hands of the divine now it's your turn to be conscientious I've been keeping track of you for all these ages now you keep track of it here the responsibility is yours and of course that staggered the religious sensibility many people were numbed by it as you can well imagine it was catastrophic 
but, but we're counting on you. We've always counted on you. Now we have to count on ourselves. Look at us. Right. Look at you. Now you have to improve yourself. Now you have to take it in hand. Now you have to work out. You can see what an ethical crush it was. What a psychological trauma it was in large, big writing. So here's the second vision which he saw, the vision of wisdom, Sophia, which Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, M-A-H-A-L-A-L-E-L, the son of Canaan, C-A-I-N-A-N, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, saw. Notice the telescoping again. They describe him as Enoch, and then they describe him as Enoch, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, on down seven times, and then, comma, saw. This entity is not just who he is existentially, but he is also that historical aggregate, combine so that he becomes a time figure. He represents not only himself, but he represents a timeline. But it's not an infinite timeline, it is a finite timeline. It is a seven generation timeline. But Enoch, remember, lives a long time before. He's of the early Genesis part. So when they get to the Messiah, we'll see with Jesus, right away in Matthew, they describe him in terms of timelines that are 42 generations long. This is an improved model. Enoch had this capacity to do all this and see all this with a seven generation timeline. Here's a man who's 42 generations long. Notice the incompleteness that in terms of the patterning, it should have been a 49 generation man. He was one cycle short. Or rather, he came as a 42-generation Messiah to show that there is a change that's going to happen when you have a 49-generation man that he's not going to look like what you thought he was going to look like. And Jesus will say, that man is going to be called the Holy Spirit. That person is no longer going to be anything like what you thought. And he says in, the, in John, he says to John, John says, why do you have to go, Master? He says, if I don't go, the counselor will not come. And he has to come in order to complete the kingdom. So we have a mystery here. The coming of the paraclete, the coming of the, of the Holy Ghost, is a jubilee phenomenon. It's a 49-generation timeline phenomenon. But because it's a complete transcendental cycle, it's no longer a man in the traditional sense. It's no longer a person in the traditional sense at all. That the last recognizable person in terms of these timelines would be Jesus. He's the last time that that divine energy has any resemblance left of human form. That after that, the evolution goes to a being, a person, who no longer needs to have these kinds of limitations at all. And the first indication of that, of course, is on Mount Hermon, in the Transfiguration, Jesus turns into light. He says, after this, um, there's no such thing as this form. It becomes a light energy. And from there, its modulations are the whole universe. This is what, what was being said. And if you listen to the tape from last week, that was one of the central themes of what happened in the beginning of the first section of the Book of Enoch. Now in the second section, this is the second vision. And we have Enoch as a seven-generation timeline being. And this is the beginning of the words of wisdom. Actually, the word here, beginning, uh, is not um, barisha, which would be uh, beginning. Uh, it can also be used in Hebrew as sum. This is the sum of the wisdom, as well as the beginning. So it has that kind of connotation. 
it's not only the beginning, it's the sum. In other words, this is a whole pattern of wisdom, and it's beginning for you because you're just opening it up, but actually it's the whole sum of the wisdom. That's what is being said here. This is the beginning sum of the words of wisdom which I lifted up my voice to speak and say to those who dwell on earth. Hear ye men of old time, and see ye that come after the words of the Holy One, which I will speak before the Lord of Spirits. So he's addressing himself to people who have come before him who are ostensibly hearing this, and to people who are yet to come, who are going to be hearing this. And he is able to say this because he is a timeline being. He exists in the past and he will exist in the future. He is not just existentially here at this moment, but he is here in all those generations also, so that the events that are happening are no longer on the writing point of the pen of destiny, but that the whole page has now become germane. In other words, the context of what is occurring is what is real, and not just the expressive writing point. This idea, incidentally, was uh, mystically best expressed, I think, in the quatrains of Omar Khayyam. The moving point of the pen writes, and the hand moves on. That kind of an idea. Sufi mysticism comes from this. Its taproot comes all the way back to this. So he says here, that he will speak before the words of the Holy One, the Holy One, which I will speak before the Lord of Spirits. Now this is a new phrase, the Lord of Spirits. He has been called before the Lord of History. He's been called many uh, revered names, but never, there's one uh, usage uh, that's similar to this in the book of Judith, but that's the only other place in the, quote, Old Testament, that this would occur. But it occurs dozens of times in the Book of Enoch that the Lord of Spirits, again, what is important here is that Yahweh is no longer simply a person, however revered, however powerful, however large, but he is Lord of Spirits. He is now visible in that capacity of being Lord of Spirits so that the spiritual realm now is germane whenever we address ourselves to him. We no longer talk only to a person, but to a whole realm. And so we have to address ourselves not as a person, but as a page of context out of the generations of man. This begins to transform man's vision of himself. This is a very powerful uh, idea. Uh, I'll give you a little um, indication of this. Um, when I was um, 12 years old, 11, 12 years old, and I'd be riding my bicycle, I would sometimes have the feeling that I was like a knight on a horse. And whenever that association would happen, I would feel that there were columns of horsemen, other knights, behind me. When I would see myself riding a bicycle, there was no indication of that at all. There's no intuition of that. But when I imagined myself a knight riding a horse, I was always at the head of a column. It was a very peculiar thing. It's this kind of a situation that in a certain perspective, in a certain psychological mood, the perspective of our existential self merges with what we're calling here a timeline being, that th all that exists at the present moment. This uh, is not a um, past lives event. This is just the opposite of that. This is that everyone is present now, so that the dimensions of a person begin to approximate um, larger slices of history than merely our own life. This prepares us to view, then, 
the divine as not a thing, not an object, but as a functional realm. This is, uh, this is new. E the Book of Enoch says then, it were, it were better to declare to the men of old, old time, but even from those that come after, we will not withhold the beginning of wisdom. Till the present day, such wisdom has never been given by the Lord of Spirits, as I have received according to my insight, according to the good pleasure of the Lord of Spirits, by whom the lot of eternal life has been given to me. He's saying this is new. This hasn't been in the Torah before. It is not in those documents. It's not in the Pentateuch, it's not in the Prophets, it's not in the Book of Wisdoms. This is new. In other words, this is the cutting edge of a development. He writes, Now three parables were imparted to me, and I lifted up my voice and recounted them to those that dwell on the earth. And I think tonight we'll have just probably time to get into the first parable. I don't want to rush this. I want to keep this uh, uh, viable. So we'll just go into it. The first parable, I have to wake Elizabeth up here. You don't want your snores on the... paragraph here. Okay. <laughs> this incidentally was uh, written about uh, between 80 and 90 BC, this section. The first section of Enoch was written about 180 BC to about 160, around in those years. And this is between 90 and 80 BC. So these are the 80s B.C. The first parable is that when the congregation of the righteous shall appear, and that's the telling phrase, when the congregation of the righteous shall appear. In other words, communities begin to occur. Enough people recognize something is wrong, something's new, something's different, and they get over their alienated state of just thinking that they're cracking up or they're going off the deep end, or they're the only one who imagines this, that enough people like that that come into contact with each other and say, wait a minute, you're experiencing life the way I'm experiencing it. What's going on here? And those people, and these people, let's get ourselves together. So, when the congregation of the righteous shall appear, and sinners shall be judged for their sins, and shall be driven from the face of the earth, and that's all one sequence. Then the next sequence comes in, uh, juxtaposed against that. And when the righteous one shall appear before the eyes of the righteous, you see the righteous one can only be seen by the righteous. Why? It's because he is a spiritual gestalt rather than a phenomenological object and only from a certain standpoint and, and shared perspective is there any possibility of, of perceiving that reality. This is why in the Mass uh, you're given communion. It's only in a state of communion that the divine appears because the divine no longer appears on the altar. The sacrifice on the altar is no longer effective. It's the communion of the congregation that's the effective part. This is one thing that's been, uh, the spiritual meaning has been leached out of Christianity and Judaism so much that it's almost unrecognizable. The focus of a religious ceremony is with the congregation and not with the altar, not with the priesthood. It is the shared communion of the congregation that makes a context whereby the divine could be experienced, could be seen. This is the whole meaning of it. This is why the, the body, the manifestation of the divine, the blood and the flesh, are given to each individual in the congregation so that they participate in this capacity to sustain the gestalt spiritual body of the presence of the Lord in their community. It is the community that is holy and no longer the temple, no longer the altar, no longer the priesthood. 
This is a radical change. This is ripping out the very seams of the old law. This is why it was said then, finally, in retrospect, that this is a whole New Testament. That we can no longer add these books to the old to a, to the Testament. That this is so different. It's of a different nature. And of course, it was radically different. When the righteous one shall appear before the eyes of the righteous, whose elect works hang upon the Lord of spirits, and light shall appear to the righteous and the elect who dwell on the earth. In other words, they won't see a person so much, but they will experience a light. The seeing of the Lord of hosts will no longer be seeing some man with a beard or some man with red hair, but of experiencing the light of understanding. And that this occurs then because the righteous one appears before the eyes of the righteous and that righteous one does certain works whose sense of organization, whose integrity of purpose hangs upon the Lord of Spirit. By, your, by their fruits you shall know them. In other words, the defining qualities are not height and weight, but works. And it's the pattern of works that then become visible. And one sees that the righteous one is he who does these works in this kind of an order with this kind of integrity. And understanding that is the light. Understanding that is the light. This is where the gnosis comes in. Because without the understanding, without the seeing of that, there is no light, there is no gnosis. But the basis of the light, the basis of the gnosis, is not some speculative psychological event, but it's rather a very uh, uh, basic, fundamental, uh, one almost might say sociological event. The first step in that whole manifestation of the light is to have a congregation of the righteous. Without that, nothing happens. There is no righteous one. There is no righteous one to produce these works that hang on the Lord of Spirits, and there is no light until there is a congregation of the righteous. So that the, there is a political message here. Nobody wanted to hear this. There were no kingdoms anywhere in the world at that time that wanted to hear this, that the people have to trust themselves rather than somebody else to let this new kind of spirit happen. They had to learn that they themselves constitute the community, that by their willingness to overlook differences and to promote cooperation among themselves, in whatever ways they could figure out. A man has to be pretty damn ingenious sometime to live with other people, as all of us know. That they were willing to do that. Yes, it's hard. Yes, sometimes it seems impossible. But unless we do this, none of the rest of this manifestation is ever going to happen. And it took about a hundred years of community experiences like this, experiments, to produce a working model where there was in fact a community of the righteous. And because of the problems of the time, they found that more and more they had to just simply let go of what we would call regular normal life functions. Because the, the problems of being together in this high pressure psychological expectant state forced them into pairing off and getting rid of all of the surplus. So we'll see by the time we get to the description of the Essene communities, like those around, around Quamran, they look like the most ascetic monastic communities you could ever run across. It was the only way they could make it work. It was just simply the only way. And where in 100 BC, there might have been one or two Essene communities. By the time you get into the 2nd century AD, 
there are so many monastic communities that they form almost cities. Along the Nile River, St. Petronius was in charge of 14 monastic communities that had thousands of people in them each. And this is where the amplification of that happened. And this then was the, was the significance to the early Christians because they said, look, look what's happened. Look at the amplification. We must be doing it right. And that's when they took it back to the cities. When they were able to have a working model of several thousands of people in the deserts, then they took it back to the cities. They went to Rome, they went to all the big cities and took it in there. And it was like the Jews coming back out of exile, the early Christians, reversed that ascetic movement of going away from the world and brought it back into the world because they realized that that was the light they had to deliver. It was the re-energizing of a dead and corrupt world structure by the light of their understanding of how things work, how people actually get along. And when it came back in, it took only about a hundred years before the entire Roman world was Christian. Oh yes, you can say ostensibly Christian. But if you look at the evidence, it was pretty well that way. It was what they call in politics a victory by acclamation. The, the eyes drowned out the nays by far. But none of that makes sense until we come back and we can see the genesis of that and understand. First of all, there has to be a congregation of the righteous. There has to be that capacity for, quote, good people to be able to come together and work together continuously, year after year, generation after generation, if need be. That without that capacity, man can do nothing. And remember, Man has the ball now. He has the ethical responsibility. The divine is no longer the man of the family. The, the, the divine is now the woman of the family. And man has to take care of her. He has to be faithful to her. He has to be responsive. That the family of, of his transcendental capacities is going to only be intact if he uh, works within that and responds to it. So first of all, there has to be a congregation of the righteous. And in Enoch it says, when the congregation of the righteous shall appear and sinners shall be judged for their sins and shall be driven from the face of the earth. This is a telescope phrase. The first line is that one will be able to judge what is right, judge what is wrong, make a decision to be able to say this is wrong not because we don't like it but because we understand the pattern and this destroys the pattern of life just like such a graphic thing as uh, uh, the 1980 epidemic of AIDS what is wrong with AIDS? AIDS destroys the immunological system it's that kind of, of, a, of a concreteness so there is the ability to judge right and wrong, to make judgments, to see. Then this whole ocean of evil will be driven from the face of the earth. What was that ocean of evil? It wasn't from an original sin. It wasn't because of Adam. Because the first part of Enoch showed the vision that it's fallen transcendental capacities, the fallen angels, who come in and mix. They mix uh, angelic powers with human blood, and that produces the giants. And when the giants die, that produces the evil spirits. This was the mythological uh, uh, statement. So that the world is dominated now by evil spirits. This is why one addresses the divine as the lord of spirits. Because on that level, in that mode, he is Lord. Before we have the uh, 
primal notion in Judaism that what was a soul in man was the divine element in man, uh, symbolized very often as his breath, the breath of life. God was the breath of life in man, that that was the divine aspect, and when man's body died, that breath went immediately back to the divine, that only when the divine was projected down into a body, that portion of the divine projected into this body was the soul of the man. The soul was nothing by itself. It was simply that projection of the divine into this body. It's like an overlapping. But when the evil spirits came in, and the mixing of the angelic powers with the blood of man happened, there's a kind of alchemy that happens. This is a basic alchemical image. Uh, the alchemical image is the white semen of men and the red blood of women. That produces the embryonic um, seed, which it, in its permutations is the essence of organic transformation. So that man's essential nature as a physiological being, as a timeline being, is a ongoing transforming permutation matrix which achieves a purposive um, apotheosis in an ultimate pattern. This is a lot of hyphens. I have to talk this way for a moment. So things have to change. They can no longer remain objective and old-fashioned because the conditions are different. And what the Book of Enoch is saying is that they have been different for a long time, only we didn't know it. That this change didn't happen now, it happened way back when. Some of the original elements in the Book of Enoch were in a previous book called the Book of Noah. And the Book of Noah was the more archaic version. But the Book of Noah was such a beginning approximation it was so insufficient in a way that when the powerful, integrated vision of the writers of the Book of Enoch came in, they excerpted the parts of the Book of Noah that could still be used, that were still viable, and integrated them into a larger pattern, more forceful, uh, comprehensive pattern. So that's what we have here. The basic pattern is that there's a congregation of the righteous, when they are a congregation, they have a relationality between themselves that allows for the righteous one to be seen. The righteous one then, having that base of con congregation, community to work from, produces a series of acts. And the acts in the congregation are balanced by the righteous one. And from that balance, when that is seen, that produces the light. It's just like making a critical mass. It's going to produce a, a nuclear fission when that critical mass is reached. And that's just what happens psychologically. The Messiah was like a spiritual atom bomb, spreading not radiation, but light. And this is just how it was seen at that time. I know that you're you're being strained somewhat by this. Let me go just a little further on and, and then we'll, we'll just continue next week. Where then will be the dwelling of the sinners? That is, when light appears to the righteous and the elect dwell on the earth, where then will be the dwelling of the sinners? And where the resting place of those who have denied the Lord of spirits? It had been good for them had they not been born because they will have no place to be. Their only place to be will be in unreality. When the kingdom comes to nature, when the divine founds itself in human life in a real way, the only place that the, those who have denied this will have to be is in unreality. There won't be any natural universe where they can be. And this, of course, um, becomes uh, extremely poignant 
in the first century AD because to all the um, Jewish elect communities that have been computing and handling this kind of a pattern now for about 150, 160 years, when they saw Nero set fire to the whole city of Rome, it looked to them exactly like the readout should, should look. They're living in unreality. They don't have any place to be. Burning Rome, the emperor, burning his own capital city, the eternal city, was the perfect symbol that the kingdom had come home. And that's when Peter went to Rome around that time. He said, this is the time. This is the place. This is the moment. When the secrets of the righteous shall be revealed and the sinners judged, know how that, notice how that goes together. The righteous get revelation and the sinners get judged. It's a polarity. It always happens in tandem. The judging of sinners is an ethical act. The revelation of to the righteous is an epistemological act. The knowing and the deciding come together. They always happen together. So there's always this. And the godless driven from the presence of the righteous and elect. From that time, those that possess the earth shall no longer be powerful and exalted. And they shall not be able to behold the face of the holy. For the Lord of Spirits has caused his light to appear on the face of the holy, righteous, and elect. In other words, they're still praying to an objective God who's in stone somewhere over there. And the divine is manifesting in the community of the righteous. It's on their faces that he exists. He is not phenomenally there anywhere. He is communally present in the community itself. That's why the community was the focus of the religion and not the priesthood and not the altars and not the icons. All this would be set aside by council after council until it was weeded out of Christianity, until it was weeded out of Judaism. This was the forbidden realization that the religious presence of the divine was in the community, the congregation, and not anywhere else. You don't give the communion. You don't give the wine and the bread to the altar, to the priesthood. You don't leave it exposed somewhere out in the sun and you don't bury it in the ground. You give it to the people because the congregation was the only reality there was for the new dispensation. And this was an insight which was intolerable to power systems because the whole notion of empire is based upon people serving the system and the system being in control of the few and the few responsive to the head man. And so divine realization is an acid to tyranny. Because when really understood, it dissolves all the false forms of government. You can cheerfully give Caesar what is Caesar's. His face is on the coin. Where is the face of the Lord? It's in the congregation of the righteous who have learned the truth. And having learned that truth, they are free. No one has any hold on them. The kingdom is not some golf course up in the sky. It's the free relationality of wholesome people together sharing the same vision. The roots and the seeds of this expressively are here in the Book of Enoch, and we'll just go on with this next week. I don't mean to tire you with this, but uh, I won't let it go. <laughs> I'm as tenacious as you can get. If it takes two months to read this book with you, I will. We have about eight or nine books like this to go through until we get to where Alexandria hosts the Messiah. Oh yeah, he's born in Bethlehem. But he is taken into Egypt. Now where do you think they took him? 
They never tell you. They never tell you. Well, let's end there, and we'll go next week.